So today's topic is going to be leadership. I want to zoom out a little bit to talking about frameworks and methods and so on and talk about the, the, like the, the you here, what you do as an RTE when you're with other people and opportunities to think about that in a structured way also. So we're going to reference a lot of science today that is native here to Sweden. Uh, it comes from the Swedish defense around leadership in high change, high stress environments that I found extremely applicable to our agile field. But I will also unfortunately force you to work today. So it's not only listen, there's going to be a few virtual post-its created and some talking to people that you don't know and stuff like that. Ooh, scary. Sorry about that. But that's just what RTEs do, right? So I'm going to bring up a mirror board. And as they mentioned here, I'm going to post in the chat a link to it. So you can just click the link and follow along in the presentation in the Miro board. And it's also the same board that we will use to work in. So click the link in the chat to see if you can open it in a web browser in the background. And then in like five or so minutes, I'm going to ask you to try and create a post-it in that board together with another person. The thing I want to talk about is how to apply, and I'm going to use a very specific word here, transformational leadership to serving the art. And this is an academic term. This has a very strict academic definition that I want to uh, work around today and look how we can actually use. And as Silvio mentioned here, I'm native to Stockholm and Sweden. I'm from the small advisory firm, We Are Movement, and we focus specifically on, on leadership and managing using modern methods, things that come from the future, like Agile. And yes, I'm a, one of those safe fellows, meaning that I spent way too much time thinking about the framework and also how to shepherd it moving forward. But as I mentioned today, we're going to be pretty framework or agile agnostic at least. And I'm, I also, as mentioned, worked a lot with these things practically, both in Sweden and internationally with agencies and, and bigger firms. But I'm also one of the transformational leadership trainers for the Swedish defense. It's actually something that I've been working on a few years to get validated as, because they have some of the top scientists in the field of leadership here in Sweden. And the, this research has accelerated the last decade, actually since the, the learnings from um, the Swedish uh, war. We were in Bosnia in, Yugos in the war at the, at the, in the Balkans in the 90s. And the learnings from that has spawned new research around leadership in Sweden. So I'm actually on the path there working with them using their models now in our field. And yes, leadership. Work, Agile doesn't replace that, unfortunately. It's still critical. I would even say that leadership is way too important to be delegated to managers. This is, this is a broader topic than that. But if we look at the formal roles embedded in leadership, Look at this. This is from the version one study. It's the last one or the survey that they do. The top six impediments to adopting and broadening the use of agile practices in an organization, very leadership heavy things. Like it clearly states out like not enough leadership participation. I can't get clearer than that. Or organizational culture at odds with agile values or inconsistent practices across teams. These are things that no single engineer could change. These are not things that a single person in a team can change. This is why we have formal leadership roles, even to help shape and guide these things. So yes, Agile doesn't replace the need for leadership. It, I would, from my experience, say it even accentuates, accelerates the need for it, but maybe not having it bound only to the roles, a manager or a leader. Leadership is broader than that. Given then that statement, what do I mean when I use this term? What's, what's the definition of, of leadership? Is it, is it what we do on Tuesdays? Is it the sprint review? Is it the business owner? Hmm, a little bit broader than that. To understand that leadership as a, as a concept, we dipping into or dipping into the, the, the academic world is pretty awesome because they have worked decades, even hundreds of years trying to understand this phenomenon. And it's actually quite straightforward. Leadership basically is something you do. It's something that you do together with another person. So if you feel strongly about a topic, a goal, a shift, something, or want something, and you want the other person 
to feel or see what you saw or felt, then the act of getting them to do that is leadership. Meaning that leadership can't be performed in a space capsule by yourself. That's a whole different story. Then we're talking about the concept called self-leadership, which is a whole different topic. That's not what we're talking about here. Here I'm talking specifically about affecting someone else with something that you feel is important or a, something you care about. I feel that this OKR is like the best ever. We should totally go for that. And then having someone else feel the same or a team feel the same is the act of leadership. So it's you with someone else. It's the context and it's a behavior. It's something you do. That's the, that's the thing here. But there, and if you look at it more theoretically, there's two angles. There's the indirect leadership, which is well, when you're not in contact with other people, they might see you online. They might see your, what you do at a distance and be influenced by it. That's a separate thing, not talking about the, that today. We're going to talk about direct leadership, meaning you and the other humans actually connect. You talk to them, you say, you, you interact, you, you work together. And in that relationship is direct leadership. So in that sense, direct leadership, talking about that today, I'm going to state that it's basically behavior in context. So with that, I'm going to ask you, to work a little bit on this. So you have been exposed to leadership in your life many times, I'm sure. Even if you're the CEO at your company, someone else, someone has led you somewhere. And it could be your spouse doing it. It could be the formal manager at your company. It could be that senior tester that actually is really awesome at her, her job that actually talks and influences you, an act of leadership. Or it could be in the, your soccer team. But my question to you is, where was the best leadership that you've ever encountered? So just, I'm going to ask you to share this with someone else and write it down on a post-it. And I'm going to ask you to write down what that person did. So I, when someone asks me this question, I, have a, I actually have a person and a situation in mind. I know him. I worked with him. He was actually my formal manager back in the day. And he had a profound impact on me. And he did things, motivate me, he did challenge me and so on. There was behaviors that he did towards me. So I'm gonna ask you to find that same situation, but it doesn't have to be work-related. Remember, it's someone else is leading you in or through something, and you are gonna try and figure out what's the behavior they did. Not like he was nice or she was, she was nice. It's more, what did they do? So you, you tried out discussing the leadership that you were exposed to. I was asking for simply what, what was your best experience? What, how did he or she that led you behave towards you? What was the nature of that direct leadership? And here's the, the trick. When you're leading, it simply means that your intent, what you send, is not the leadership. Uh, hopefully you, you discovered some of that uh, nuance when you talk to people here that it's actually what happens in you. So you, you have a behavior, you say, I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going to maybe challenge you or motivate you or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to affect you. If the other person doesn't perceive it to be that, then that is the truth of what the leadership actually implies. So your intent is actually not the leadership. It's the reception it sort of happens on the other end. So if you want to understand what type of leadership you're exposing people to, you have to go into their experience of things. Sounds straightforward, but it actually, for me, that's a huge difference. This is what I'm doing. And then people say, well, this is what I'm perceiving. Then the perception is the truth here. Huge challenge when you're leading. So what I'm going to zoom in then on is something called transformational leadership, which is a different definition of it and a way to think through those behaviors. Because if leadership is actually the direct leadership is the behavior that you expose others to from you and they perceive it in one way, what are good behaviors then? What, what creates an effect? What is, what is strong? What, is, what, what makes a difference? Well, if you want to start talking about that, we first need to talk a little bit about history, because leadership is not a new phenomenon. It's been studied throughout the centuries. 
or at least the last 100 years. And if you go back way, way, way back, leadership was more or less seen, if you go back to Aristotle, Plato, even uh, Machiavelli, uh, his book, The Prince, uh, it's actually an early leadership book, a bit scary though, because the view on, on how to lead is uh, not uh, what I would call modern. But back then, if you go back, way back before the 40s, most studies of it saw it as a property of the person leading. Basically, it's something imbued in your the atoms that make up your body. So you either have it or you don't. And they argue back and forth if you're born with it or if you get it through something. But it's still embodied in, yeah, she can lead, she cannot. That was basically how it was mainly understood in theoretical terms and up until sort of the 1940s-ish when it started changing. From the 40s and onwards, if you look at the, the thing in both academia and practical in the practical world, it was mainly starting to be understood as a thing that could vary. You could do it in different ways. So the Industrial Revolution met uh, the, the concept and out came styles, variations of it, the motive, and also your need for doing it. Why are you doing it? Those started to become nuances that showed that there's different ways of leading. There's not only the way or one way. This doesn't mean that the concept of having properties around it was useless. That's still part of it, but it was understood more new as a more nuanced phenomenon. 60s and onwards, there's a huge body of research around the, not huge, but a big one around the 80s and 90s for uh, servant leadership, for example. And here, the situation and context has, was the focus for around 30 years. Uh, situational leadership, servant leadership, and so on. What the, that science told us was that where it's performed, the, the context, what environment, and so on, what's the situation, has a huge impact on what is effective or not. Again, not refuting the earlier science, just mainly broadening or nuancing it. There's, yeah, your the properties of you, and there's different motivations for doing it and styles, and the context also is important. The biggest amount of research, though, is in the last 20 years, and that's the transformational part. Here, where the majority of the science, science has been. And in this view, that is the most modern today, what we're seeing is that all the literature on this, all the studies basically point towards it being a phenomenon that could best be understood as a relationship. Sounds very natural when I say it out loud that actually, if you lead someone, if you expose them to your behavior, trying to do something, they actually influence you back. So in understanding that, that feedback loop is critical. So basically saying the basis of, of a leadership, a direct leadership is the relationship. You affect them, they affect you. It's not a transaction. You don't send. You send and you receive. So with this view, a few notions, a few different notions appear. So I'll show you. What happens is that the behaviors then form a continuum. So different types of behaviors can be understood, leadership behaviors can be understood, be understood as either transformational. In Swedish, this is Sweden, this is called utvecklande, uh, translated as into developmental by the Defense uh, University, as a uh, transformational leadership style, meaning that those are cert certain behaviors. And then there's conventional leadership behaviors, and then actually there's even the destructive ones, which are interesting to read about the study because we've all experienced them from time to time and they are actually counterproductive, <laughs> let me tell you. The trick here is if you look at the transformational leadership studies and the application of it, this is not a type model, meaning that this is not your green or red or blue or, hey, I'm an Aquarius and I'm from Stockholm. It's not, no, the, this is a continuum of behaviors that we all exhibit. I do a lot of transformational behaviors, yes, but I also, as from time to time, can aspire to dip into some destructive behaviors if I'm not careful. Maybe if I'm stressed, uh, if I haven't slept well and so on. And from time to time, conventional leadership behaviors might be needed. So think of it as a behavioral continuum. It's basically the frequency of these behaviors that you do in your role as an RT. So diving a little bit deeper, there is a model for this. Yes, you might even call it a framework. I said no frameworks tonight, but can't help myself. So here's one from Sweden. This is from uh, the Swedish Defense University. This is the Der Science, the developmental leadership 
built on the transformational international phenomenon. And basically, you have the green stuff, which are the transformational behaviors. You have the blue and yellow, which are conventional behaviors. And then you have the red ones, which are destructive behaviors. And the best way to understand this is that the axis, the horizontal one, is basically the how favorable these behaviors are to creating the results you're looking for, specifically if you're working in a high change, even high stress environment. And the vertical axis is the, the behaviors, basically your ability to use transformational behaviors or conventional behaviors. So social science, it's hard, it's hard to talk about causality, but what we can see is correlation. So Basically, the science is very clear today. There's a lot of big meta studies done on that. The transformational behaviors correlate positively with favorable circumstances for results, meaning that we see in the organizations where more of those behaviors are exhibited, more results, whatever the results are in the end that the organization is seeking. So zooming in here, what does this, what is this then, the, the green stuff? Well, transformational leadership behaviors exemplary authentic model, having individual consideration and inspiration and motivation. Pretty straightforward. But if you zoom in even more, the first one essentially means that I model the behaviors that I want to see. So if you look at me working, you will also see what I perceive to be the way. Very effective. If you're a parent, you know this. The kids don't do what you say, they do what you do. So watch out for your behaviors. And also the responsibility part. I take responsibility even in tough times. So if, if bad things happen in my art, I'll still say as an RT, I'm sorry that happened. It's all, this is my fault. We can do better together. How can we fix this? I don't push the blame to others. I say, I'm also part of this environment. What happens here is partly my responsibility. And working from understood values, making sure they're seen. So when discussing, for example, trade-offs or priorities, you might, rather than state out exactly what you're, you think, you might say, these things are immutable, unchangeable things. If you're an RT, you might say, I like small batches, yay, past feedback. So given that, how would we then choose? Or if you have personal things, like I strongly feel about humans, like there's a huge potential in every human that I meet. This is something I don't sort of, this is not negotiable. So that's the first sort of thing that I bring to any discussion or any prioritization or any trade-off that I make. So those behaviors are transformational. And also being able to connect with people, support, but also confront. Meaning that if, so, if you see someone doing something that might hurt someone, that might go bad, you might say, oh, I'm going to be... I'm going to do my transformational behavior, so I'm going to stay away. Like, no, it actually shows that being there saying, hey, I see you're about to make this big mistake. Can I help out? That's confronting someone when something bad is about to happen. And finally, inspire and motivate. Promote the participation and creativity needed. As an RTE, this is if you organize PI planning, if you facilitate forums where others collaborate, you're doing this. Rather than saying, here's the path, you say, here's the frame, let's work within that. That's a transformational behavior. So th this sounds like a nice, right? Green, good. Well, the trick here is that if you look at the science, there's also a need for this, the conventional behaviors. And this is more straightforward. You'll recognize these from more traditional organizations also. Things like having agreements, taking necessary measures, so the trick here is that there's a, there's a divider here. There is a line here. I'm going to make a green line here. So there's conventional behaviors, these ones that are actually useful. These are powerful. But this, on the flip side, if you do them in a specific way, they might turn out to be quite negative. Demand and reward, meaning from a positive standpoint, that seeking actively seeking agreements around the work. So you're asking for what's our definition of done? How do we, what PI objectives are going to have this PI? Let's define them together. Those are ways to seek agreement. Basically looking for, we try to do this, we, we get to this goal. That a more conventional leadership behavior. This is still useful. And also control, very loaded word, but 
taking necessary measures, like making sure that we actually implement proper, uh, as far as possible we can test coverage in a product and so on. More the behaviors to seek the, to take those necessary measures if needed are more conventional. Although if you do them the wrong way, you might end up here where basically demand and reward and control becomes conventional, yes, but counterproductive. This is basically saying that I'm doing the demand and reward conventional behaviors, but I'm doing it sort of if, but only if reward. Traditional sales target sort of. If you do this, you get that. And also control over control, the flip side of necessary measures, which is the perception of what you're doing is that you're micromanaging. When you're down here, motivation is completely deflated. The trick is that the, many of the conventional behaviors are still needed when you work, even if you're trying a transformational approach, but you want to be careful to stay above this line. And the hard thing is that the perception of, is it this or that? It's literally in the perception. So the same behavior can be perceived as slightly sort of, take this example, necessary measures. I usually ask myself when I am taking the necessary measures, I might inject myself in a team or do something very direct, like I need to be very hands-on right now. If they perceive that I'm doing it because I am scared to be seen as incompetent or lack control, they're going to say it is this. However, if they see it as, hey, he's here to help us to not make a mistake, to not hurt ourselves, for example, they're going to say it is the good stuff. So the trick is often to think when it comes to conventional behaviors, who has the need? For who am I doing this? And then finally, the more scary part down here, the destructive behaviors. This is actually a quite new addition to the research. The last few years, this was not part of the research before. They were looking more at the positive stuff. But after doing proper research on this, the uh, defense agencies showed clearly that this is actually where your main focus should be, meaning in not doing this. So the active destructive and passive destructive behaviors are, when they're done, the damage is so often so profound that it can take a huge amount of time to recover trust and to rebuild the ability to tackle complex problems again. And active destructive behaviors are literally, you, you'll know it when you see it, it's being an asshole. It's like being arrogant, threatening people, false, ego-oriented. Hopefully we've never met that leader, but a few of us have. And the, the cost of that is, well, as you know, fear people afraid of trying things or doing anything and actually unfortunately the science shows us that one <laughs> sort of one time of this requires five times as much good stuff to sort of make up for it so the cost of one of these actions is one time is no no time but every day huge massive problem but the, interestingly the passive ones are the most damaging and that is basically you might be in charge of something. You say that you're a business owner, but as soon as a critical question comes up, you're like, I don't know, you, I don't have time to decide. Uh, sorry, I have another meeting. Or being very, very unclear. Should we, should we use agile methods? Like, uh, I think both. I, mm, yeah, I don't know. So sort of, you, I, I, I have to leave now. That stuff is super damaging. And that was a bit of a, uh, that, it was insight generating for me because the, weirdly, when someone in a leadership position is using active destructive behaviors, by accident, they build a team because now actually everyone has a joint enemy, which is that asshole um, leader. So that actually is better than the passive one, which just causes confusion, uh, lack of clarity and just uncertainty. So actually, that is not better, but less worse than the passive part. So basically saying, don't go there. Trick though, as I mentioned, we all exist on this continuum. When I work in my practical work, I might be up more doing more of the transformational behaviors, dipping into conventional when needed, and from time to time, maybe touching on destructive behaviors because they're perceived like that or because I'm in a position where that happens to me. The trick is to try and stay out of it as much as possible and shift towards more transformational behaviors. 
So again, perfectly available model from the defense agency built for high change, high stress environments, solid empirical base today and highly useful to understand sort of what behaviors are create result, which ones are needed and which ones should we stay away from as much as possible. So this is the model. And what do we do with this then? Well, some tips for you. Yeah. As I mentioned, the research is available. It's funded by the Swedish state. So it's actually public, public domain. It's fully available. There's a few good books on the topics, as I mentioned. There's also some good trainings to use. Uh, scale agile's uh, leadership training leading in a digital age isn't necessi necessarily a transformational leadership course but i've seen parts of it i've been through it myself it has stephen mayner who was the creator for it is actually his his phd was in, in transformational leadership so it has those connotations it's not based on the empirical uh, work though it's basically a regular leadership course the one I use in Sweden is the one from the Swedish defense called Utvecklande Lederskap, which is strict to this science, to this research. Those are good tools to use when building it. And when it comes to recommendations in general on this topic, I would one just make sure your behaviors matter. They do. But the more your words and your actions align, the better. Because if there's a gap in between, you have a huge problem. People will sniff it out immediately. And remember, the say-do loop, you say you're going to do something, and then you do it. It's a trust-building exercise. And you're doing it, you're doing it again, you're building that trust, you're becoming more, more authentic in what you're doing, basically. The other thing, it's hard for the system to see itself. So if you want to understand not only because you know what you're doing, but you want to understand how does it land, get help, find a friend, say that you're the RTE and you're looking at this going like, maybe I should do more of the, see if I can, or am I actually doing any of the transformational behaviors? Is that how it's perceived? You might ask a scrum master, someone else to watch you while you're working, ask, present them with this model and then go, can you watch me in the next PI planning and tell me how the things I do are received. Because the trick is that even if you think you're doing a transformational behavior, like I'm super motivating here, people might say he wasn't, he, that was aggressive. And then immediately it was actually a, dis a destructive active behavior. So someone watching you work and then feeding back to you, here's what I saw when you worked, might give you insight on, okay, I'm doing it wrong. I am actually deflating motivation with my actions by doing it this way. And also, if you're going to do one thing, take one takeaway from this, just don't do the destructive behaviors. Just stay away from them. We all do them from time to time. We tend to slide on the scale depending on the context, the situation, where we are. Remember, it's not a type model. It's not what you are. It's literally what behaviors you exhibit. And be very careful with these. If you just stop this we make a huge impact because the cost of just a few of these are massive and also the conventional behaviors you look at seek agreements take necessary measures and so on when you're shifting into agile methods or agile work styles i've encountered a few times that people say we should stop doing these conventional behaviors they're they're not needed in this context mm, well Look at the science go, they are still useful if done in the right situation, the right context, and in the right tone, meaning that you go from your needs when doing them to the people that you work with, their needs. So don't throw these away. They are still needed. And from time to time, challenge yourself. Try a transformational approach even more often. Think about how could I, in this situation that we're encountering now, the openly discuss what values are important maybe or try to model what i think is the the best behaviors here and maybe is think about think around how do i do this this discussion or this situation so that the others in there feel the ownership or the motivation for doing it not through me but through themselves so just try it out as a sort of how would this work if i could do it more if you minimize the destructive behaviors doing a difference if you're doing a little bit more of this, you're adding something to it even better than that. And beyond that, check out the research. It's out there. 
Uh, I'll present a more comprehensive approach in the RTE Summit in November with a few tools for, for this also that will be available for you all. But in Sweden, this is how leadership is done. And for me, it is maps perfectly to work with that also. So that's all for me tonight. That's the entire presentation and your workshop. Thanks for all the hard work. <laughs>